Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you today someone who is very, very knowledgeable about international law. I'm speaking to Professor John uh, Dugard, who is also really hard to introduce because of his many achievements as a scholar and a law practitioner. He was a professor and the dean of the law faculty at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, and he later worked as a full professor at Leiden University. He served three times as a judge for the International Court of Justice and was for 14 years a member of the United Nations International Law Commission, which is the United Nations main body responsible for codifying new international law. Beyond this, he was also working on many other international law assignments throughout his career. And Professor Duggard is also a long-standing advocate for equal rights in his home, South Africa, and in Palestine, where he has several times worked and spoken out for the rights of the Palestinians. Professor Dugar, um, thank you for joining me today. Hey, nice to meet you, Pascal. Um, Professor, the first thing I probably want to talk to you about is this wonderful article that you wrote recently um, entitled The Choice Before Us, International Law or a Rules-Based International Order, where you beautifully lay out that this, this catchphrase of the Rules-Based International Order is anything but international law. Um, could you maybe lay out to us why this catchphrase has nothing to do with international law? Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say it has nothing to do with international law. It is a uh, an expression, a phrase that has entered the language of politicians and to a lesser extent language of lawyers. Uh, and quite frankly, I don't know what it means. And that is the difficulty. And uh, when I speak to uh, international law colleagues, I ask them whether they have Consider the matter, most of them have not. Occasionally I meet someone who is troubled by the use of the term, but uh, lawyers tend to dismiss this as harmless political rhetoric. I'm a bit more concerned about it because uh, politicians increasingly refer to the rule-based order or the rule-based international order rather than to international law. And quite, quite frankly, I don't know what they mean by this. And uh, the purpose of my article was to draw attention to the question of what it actually means. Why do you think it is that some politicians, especially in the United States, uh, have started replacing references to international law with references to the rule-based order? Well, the problem is particularly uh, prevalent in the United States, where both President Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken repeatedly use this term. Uh, President Biden uh, hardly ever uses the term international law. He always refers to the rules-based order. Uh, Antony Blinken is perhaps a bit better, but he also mainly refers to the rules-based uh, international order. Uh, Western leaders also frequently uh, use this term. Uh, so it, it is one that uh, is used frequently today. And uh, the question that I explored in my article is why the use of this term? And I can't quite understand why Western leaders other than those of the United States use this term because they have uh, committed themselves to most multilateral international law treaties and they accept customary international law and they accept the uh, rules of the United Nations and the uh, general interpretations placed on customary international law. But when it comes to the United States, the situation is different because there are good reasons why the United States might prefer to use the term rule-based international order rather than international law. <clears throat> and here yeah, I can uh, advance three reasons. First of all, there's the fact that uh, 
the United States is not a party to uh, many basic fundamental multilateral treaties. Take, for instance, the uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. The United States is not a party to this convention. And that explains why Secretary of State Blinken repeatedly uh, calls on China to observe the rule-based order in respect of the South China Sea. It's because he cannot appeal to the Law of the Sea Convention. And there are other important conventions, particularly those governing uh, human rights or humanitarian law. So, for instance, the United States is not a party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, nor is it a party to the 1977 Geneva Protocols, which uh, deal with uh, the laws of war. It is not a party to the uh, Convention on Cluster Munitions or uh, anti-personnel mines. And so the United States is uh, really uh, out of the main loop, so to speak, when it comes to uh, multilateral treaties. We, we saw this recently, incidentally, in the case of the United States decision to provide uh, cluster munitions to Ukraine. Uh, this was a very difficult question for many Western European states because they are all party to the uh, cluster munitions convention, whereas the United States uh, is not. And there are other conventions, such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is a basic human rights convention. So the United States is not a party to many multilateral treaties. So uh, it, yes. is it is it fair to say that the United States likes to appeal to uh, law and order without being bound by the laws that most states around the world are signed up to? I think the United States is determined to uh, not necessarily impose its view on the rest of the world, but to inform the rest of the world that it is bound only by those rules of international law to which it is a party, treaties to which it is a party, and that it is uh, bound to accept only its own interpretation of many rules, particularly the rules governing the use of force. And uh, I think too, as uh, I will later explain, the United States uh, practices exceptionalism in respect of states that are friends and a different kind of exceptionalism in respect of states that are seen to be enemies. Some people are quite cynical about the rules-based order, saying what it means is that the United States makes the rules and orders everybody else to follow. Well, if I understand you correctly, you're saying you're interpreting it more as a as a vehicle for the US not to have to appeal to uh, treaties that it itself doesn't uh, the, uh, isn't a signatory state to. Yes, well, the United States simply prefers to invoke some system other than international law when it comes to dealing with areas such as the law of the sea, where it cannot uh, appeal to states to abide by the uh, rules of the law of the sea convention because it is not a party to the convention. Uh, when it comes to the uh, interpretation of international law, it's a different question. There, the United States in, is simply saying that we interpret the law differently from the way in which you do. But uh, it does interpret the law very differently in many important respects. And we have seen several instances in which the United States took out the right to actually um, remind other states that they have to adhere to treaties that it itself is not part of. I, I can think right now of 
the cases where the United States is telling everybody that they have to adhere to the uh, to to the Rome Statute, and uh, especially South Africa, telling the South South Africa that it has to arrest uh, Vladimir Putin should he should he step uh, on on African uh, on South African soil, um, because it is it is a party to the International uh, Criminal Court. And the second one I can think of is the JCPOA. Uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, where, where, from which the United States withdrew back in 2016 and then two years later told Iran to abide by the JCPOA, which it signed. And it, it, it used that under Mike Pompeo very aggressively saying like, look, they are not adhering to the to the very treaty that we withdrew from and we take the right to to uh, tell everybody they have to uh, abide, uh, abide by that. Yes, those are two very telling examples of the way in which the United States views uh, international law. I think the uh, whole question of the International Criminal Court is particularly interesting because you may recall that uh, it was only a few years ago that the United States imposed sanctions on the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Fatou Ben Suda, for uh, pursuing Americans in Afghanistan and uh, she was uh, subjected to sanctions in the United States as was one of her colleagues. Uh, so at that stage the United States was very hostile to the International Criminal Court and there is a statute in the United States called the Invasion of the Hague Act which in effect uh, authorizes the United States to uh, invade the Hague to uh, interfere with any prosecution of an American national before the International Criminal Court. So the United States has a very hostile attitude towards the International Criminal Court. But now it finds it very convenient to uh, uh, elevate the uh, International Criminal Court to the position of a, uh, an international criminal uh, tribunal because that is the only court that uh, might pursue a prosecution of President uh, Putin. And uh, so we find that the United States uh, uh, warmly supports the International Criminal Court in respect of Ukraine. But at the same time, it condemns vigorously any attempt on the part of the International Criminal Court to prosecute uh, Israel for substantially similar crimes. So the double, double standard is very evident. Um, you, in your article, you also wrote a passage about that it is not fair to call um, people who point out the double standards as engaging in whataboutism, which is what you what we often hear. It's like, okay, you cannot compare these cases of the United States with other cases because that would be whataboutism. Um, this is just a very, very thin defense of double standards, isn't it? Yes, well, it, it's a practice that is engaged in by other states. As I pointed out in my article, uh, President Putin has also indulged in this uh, practice of arguing what about or to quoque, as the Latins would have it, uh, saying that, well, you've engaged in these illegal practices, why can't we? Uh, but th this is not uh, an accepted form of legal reasoning. But there is the issue of precedence, isn't it? Like the the issue that under international law and under the United Nations Charter, we have a certain set of rules, like the territorial um, integrity and sovereignty of the state. Now, we have cases in which the West infringed on those rights. I mean, most blatantly through what happened in Kosovo, but also the Golan Heights and all the other uh, territorial acquisitions of, of, of Israel, right? Those are outright violations. And then a state like Russia actually also makes then, uh, says like, I have a precedence there, I'm going to do the same now, and therefore it's fine. Yes, exactly. And the other example I didn't mention is that of the invasion of Iraq in 2003, which it was a very good example of uh, the double standard. But I think that the, uh, the annexation of the Donetsk uh, 
is a very interesting example because uh, essentially Israel has done that in respect of uh, Jerusalem and the Golden Heights. It has unlawfully annexed the territory of another state. And the United States recognizes this. It, it uh, has recently recognized the uh, uh, sovereignty of Israel over the Golden Heights. And uh, it has also done this in respect of uh, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem in particular. The, uh, you will recall that uh, the United States was very careful to uh, locate its embassy outside Jerusalem, uh, as was the uh, case with most other states in the international community. But under President Trump, the decision was taken to relocate the embassy to Jerusalem. And uh, the Biden administration has not interfered with this. In fact, it has uh, gone along with this decision. So you have this bizarre situation in which the United States condemns the annexation of the Crimea or the Donetsk uh, by uh, Russia, but at the same time condones or approves of the uh, annexation of uh, territory by Israel. And as, as sad as it is, but um, the, we still have this problem that we don't have a global leviathan, right? We have no ultimate arbiter or judge of what is legal and what, what's not. The, the, the nation state is still the highest arbiter. And we can see how the United States is trying very hard to shape this international order in a way that it wants with one set of rules for these kind of countries and another set of rules of the, for these kind of, for the other kind of countries in your experience as a uh, with international law um are we on a downward trend away from international law or has this problem that we are seeing now always been present well i think the uh, recourse to uh rules-based international order is a new phenomenon mm. and it is a threat to uh, international law and uh, the problem is that it's not an issue which is addressed by most international lawyers but to return to the other question you raised about the failure of international law to uh, provide for an arbiter in the case of international disputes so that's not absolutely correct. The International Court of Justice is always uh, there to settle disputes and increasingly the International Court of Justice does deal with uh, real issues. There was a time when the International Court of Justice was really confined to uh, settling relatively minor territorial disputes between states. But today one sees that the major political issues of the day are often brought before the court where mm. there is some jurisdictional basis uh, for this. And that's the problem. The states must consent to the jurisdiction of the court. Right. And the, the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, is an organ of the United Nations that was established through the UN Charter. So every state that is part to the UN Charter is also bound to the rulings of the ICJ, right? That's where it's jurisdiction stems from? Uh, no, not quite. Uh, the ICJ, International Court of Justice, is an organ of the United Nations, but uh, it's an organ to which states, a judicial body to which states uh, can go to settle their disputes, provided that they consent. So states must also consent to being bound by the uh, dispute before the International Court of Justice. Many states have uh, issued a declaration saying that they will accept the jurisdiction of the court in respect of all disputes. Uh, many have not. The United States, Russia, China have not, for instance. Uh, but uh, frequently states enter into multilateral treaties which provide that in the event of any dispute about the uh, uh, issue that it may re 
he referred to the International Court of Justice. And uh, so we see that often states are brought before the court almost unwillingly. So, for instance, the uh, Convention on Race Discrimination has a provision that states agree to uh, accept the jurisdiction of the International Court in respect of any uh, interpretation of the uh, treaty. And this has enabled states to uh, refer many very controversial political issues uh, to the International Court of Justice. So the International Court is at present considering a number of states under the Convention uh, Against Race Discrimination, which uh, really go beyond the question of race discrimination. Um, in in your experience, uh, are there cases when even great powers succumbed to the judgment of the ICJ, like the US, Russia, or the Soviet Union, China, uh, France, Britain? Do we have cases when they actually had to turn around and say, like, okay, fine, I was wrong? Uh, no, not in respect of crucial. Uh, issues involving their national interest. So I can't think of any case in which Russia, China, or the United States have accepted the court's jurisdiction. And they're not the only ones, for instance. We see that the uh, United Kingdom is at present uh, facing a difficulty in respect of uh, the Chagos Islands, where the International Court gave uh, an advisory opinion, which was not strictly binding on states that the uh, United Kingdom had uh, behaved unlawfully in uh, severing the Chagos Islands from Mauritius. And, uh, but it does seem that there are negotiations underway, which may result in the United Kingdom accepting this uh, opinion. So that's an example, perhaps, of uh, one of the permanent five uh, accepting the uh, the uh, decisions of the court. At least one hopes that it does accept it. Now, cynics in international relations, especially like cynic realists, they argue that at the end of the day, international law doesn't matter because states do whatever they can anyhow. But a very, very nifty international lawyer recently pointed out, which I think is absolutely true, that states hate being seen as breaching the law. Uh, China keeps saying that what it is doing in the South China Sea is within a legal framework, um, an obscure one, but it says there is a legal framework, namely historical uh, precedence, which is not part of the of uh, international law sources. The United States keeps appealing to the rules based order. So states want to be seen as acting lawfully. Um, do you see chances that international law can be developed further into a direction that binds these states further to the to an actual rules based order? Yes, I think this is a very important point. It, it, what one might describe as the international law habit. The states like to be seen to be observing international law. Mm. So, in history, I think there's only one clear example of a state or leader that in effect said international law is not binding on me and that was the case of Adolf Hitler. Mm. But uh, other states have uh, justified their action in terms of international law. So if one uh, looks at the uh, Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, one finds that uh, when President Putin announced uh, or declared war in effect on uh, Ukraine, he made a statement in which he justified uh, Russia's action in terms of the law of self-defense. Uh, it was a very bizarre interpretation of international law of the right of self-defense, but nevertheless, it was an appeal to an international law argument. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the same applies to uh, the United States, and this is why I think the uh, notion of the rules-based order 
has entered the language of international law. That uh, it's a way of saying, look, we uh, are not going to abide by international law as it is strictly known, but we're going to observe our own version of international law, which is the rules-based order. When did you actually hear the sentence for the first time? Because I can't remember when it happened, um, but it's fairly recent, right? Yes, I'm told it goes back uh, beyond the uh, Biden administration, but it's, it's a term which has been used very frequently by the Biden administration. And uh, for instance, when President Biden first condemned Russia for invading Ukraine, he said that uh, Russia had to violate the rule-based order rather than saying uh, that international law had been violated, as the Europeans said. Right, the Europeans kept saying that, but the, the, the issue then is, and um, this is quite important, the Russians are actually careful to uh, to always make an international law argument. The it's quite interesting that for eight years, uh, the Russians refrained from recognizing the Donetsk and Lugansk uh, separatist regions as independent nation states. And only five days before the invasion, they recognized them, which then uh, made it possible to actually say that they are just helping them in self-defense. So from the viewpoint of these two interpretations, we now have two cases of self-defense, right? Which are the only legal moments when states are allowed to use means of yes. warfare. Yes, it's interesting that uh, you refer to this because it does indicate that Russia is very determined to act with in what it regards to be uh, international law. So it's a, it's a, Russia's own interpretation of international law. You might say that Russia is in effect invoking a rules-based order, but it doesn't go that far. In fact, uh, both Russia and China have uh, rebuked the United States for referring to uh, the rules-based order and said, you must abide by international law as we understand it. And uh, th this is something that troubles me, that there is this conflict between the United States and Russia and China, on the other hand, over the uh, use of the term rules-based order. Yeah. And just for everybody uh, watching this, could you explain to us what is the normal mechanism for making international law? Well, the, there are two... Uh, ways of making international law. Uh, first is by practice. If states engage in a particular practice for a long period of time, uh, it is said that a customary rule of international law has been uh, created. So this is the common law of international law, as it were. So common lawyers uh, will understand the use of this term more easily than civil lawyers. That's the one basis for international law, but the most obvious one is uh, the treaty. States enter into written agreements with each other to proclaim rules of international law, and they may do this uh, bilaterally in terms of an agreement between two states only, in which states agree, for instance, to uh, engage in trade with each other or to extradite criminals. And for that purpose, you need only a treaty, bilateral treaty between two states. But increasingly, particularly since uh, the uh, adoption of the Charter in 1945, states have uh, re uh, had recourse to multilateral treaties, which uh, are signed by many states, hopefully all states, uh, which uh, lay down rules of law, which only bind those states' parties to the treaty, but many states have uh, ratified many of the most basic treaties. So, for instance, you, you take the Geneva Conventions on the Laws of War of 1949. Uh, I think every state, recognized state in the international community, has 
uh, become a party to the Geneva Conventions. And then there are the basic human rights conventions like the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on the Elimination of Race Discrimination, Discrimination Against Women, or Convention Against Torture, and so on and so forth. There are a multitude of uh, human rights conventions which bind states. Then you have the Law of the Sea Convention, which uh, uh, binds most states because most states have uh, signed and ratified the uh, law of the sea convention. Mm -hmm. uh, so today, international law consists mainly of rules created by agreement, by express agreement in writing, in the form of treaties, multilateral or bilateral. And then there is a second source of international law, as it were, which is to be found in customary international law, which uh, relates to the practice of states over many years. What happens in cases where um, a group of countries are party to a multilateral treaty inside the United Nations, but not all of them? The most famous one recently is the Treaty on the um, prohibition on nuclear weapons, the TPNW, which was signed by over 50 states, but it is opposed vehemently by the actually all five great powers, <laughs> US, China, Russia, uh, France, and the UK, and with them also a part of the West, they're all saying, nah, we don't want that one. But uh, smaller states, um, including also Austria and so on, uh, and African states, they have signed up to it, and more than 50 ratifications have been done. What What's the status of this treaty then on how binding is it for others? Well, I think this is an example of a treaty which is only in strict law binding on states that have signed it, but it is nevertheless a uh, treaty which uh, does influence the behavior of states. And so uh, at present, since uh, 1945, there has been no recourse to nuclear weapons. And to a large extent, that's a result of treaties which are binding on many states, but not on, not on all. So I, I think there's a general uh, awareness that uh, international law prohibits recourse to uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting, for instance, if you, again, to take the case of Israel, that uh, everyone knows Israel has nuclear weapons. But the United States pretends that it doesn't. And you can't really discuss this matter in the United States because it's a taboo. Uh, but at the same time, Israel is aware of the fact that uh, it is obliged to refrain from the use of nuclear weapons. True, and Israel hasn't used nuclear weapons. Um, true, so there is there is a mechanism. 